So then we come to the lung involvement. Now the lungs are, um, are commonly affected in scleroderma. But sometimes it's really very minor. You can have very minor degrees of lung involvement, but unfortunately you can have much more severe um, forms of lung involvement. And we sometimes call lung involvement pulmonary involvement. It's just another way of saying the same thing. So there are two major types of lung involvement that you get, or you can get. And one of them is the fibrosis, that's the scarring of the lungs, which starts off at the bases of the lungs. And I, I'm going to say a little bit about more than that afterwards. And the other type of lung involvement that you get is this condition called pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, it's a little bit complicated, but pulmonary hypertension is, is one thing, and pulmonary arterial hypertension is a subgroup within pulmonary hypertension. It's one of the causes of pulmonary hypertension is pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so pulmonary arterial hypertension is a problem, it's not so much, it depends how you define it. Some people wouldn't say that that was lung involvement, but uh, for the purposes of just now, I think we can consider mm -hmm. it lung involvement. It's involvement of the artery that goes from what we call the right side of the heart to the lungs. It's a problem with that artery. And that these arteries can, or at least the right and left one, but they can become involved in, in scleroderma, particularly in, in, in the more sort of vascular type of scleroderma as we heard earlier today with the centromere antibody and the, the limited type. Whereas it's interesting because lung fibrosis, because of back pressure from the lungs, it can cause pulmonary hypertension, but there isn't pulmonary arterial hypertension. So it can be a little bit confusing, I'm happy to, to dis discuss it. But basically, um, you know, when you measure blood pressure, when people say that they have hypertension, most people, they mean the sort of hypertension that you measure with uh, a, what we call sphygmomanometer. And that measures the pressure at the left side of the heart. Measuring the pressure on the right side of the heart is much more complicated. But that's the problem that we can get in scleroderma. So what might you complain of if, uh, to warn you that you might have one of these things? Well, the symptoms of lung disease are that you might complain of breathlessness. Um, people with lung fibrosis can have a cough. It's often a dry cough. And you occasionally get other symptoms, for example, swelling of the ankles, although there are a whole lot of reasons why people get, get ankle swelling, so it may be nothing to do with it, but you sometimes can get ankle swelling. And what sort of tests would your doctor ask for? Most people with scleroderma will at some point, probably at first, visit have a chest x-ray. That will show up extensive lung fibrosis. It won't show up very minor degrees of lung fibrosis. Um, an echocardiogram, that's a test when you, it's a cardiac ultrasound, when you get some jelly in the chest and someone tips you over on the left-hand side and looks at the different heart chambers. That's useful to look for pulmonary hypertension. You can't diagnose pulmonary hypertension from an echocardiogram, but you can suspect it. Breathing tests, pulmonary function tests, they're useful for detecting both pulmonary hypertension and lung fibrosis because you get different patterns of abnormality in the lung function test. These are the tests when you usually go into a big sort of box thing and have to breathe in and out for the pulmonary function test. So most people with scleroderma will be recommended to have these tests quite regularly, every one to two years, so that we can look and see whether there are any problems developing. Because the problem is that if you're very fit, you know, and you can run up um, three or four flights of stairs, you're very unlikely to have any of, of these things. But the problem that with scleroderma, unfortunately, often you're not terribly mobile, or at least you might not be because of joint involvement, skin involvement, muscle involvement. And so we can't necessarily tell if someone's breathless. So that's why we have to do these additional um, tests. And they're very sensitive to pick up abnormalities. We often get an ECG or an electrocardiogram. In fact, we, we usually would. That's just a very straightforward test. Um, an HRCT scan, that stands for High Resolution um, Computed Tomography. That's a test that you go in and it's a sort of donut thing, it's a very quick <coughs> test. But that's very sensitive <coughs> for looking at lung fibrosis. It will show minor degrees of lung fibrosis as well as more extensive lung fibrosis. And we probably wouldn't repeat this test several times, but we would probably do it you know, at, at one or more points, just depending on the clinical situation. If as a result of the echocardiogram and the pulmonary function tests, we suspected that someone might have pulmonary hypertension, then we would, we, the, the individual needs to have further tests because 
and that test, these tests are more complicated. And the system in the United Kingdom is that we have different pulmonary vascular units. For example, I work in Salford and Manchester, and we refer to Sheffield for further investigation because that's our nearest pulmonary vascular unit. So if we were worried that someone might have pulmonary hypertension, then we would refer them to Sheffield, and they might do a test called a right heart catheter, and they might do some additional tests. Okay, so this is just to give you an example. This is a chest x-ray. It's not a good chest x-ray at all, I'm afraid, but you can maybe see that there's a whole lot of mottling in these lung fields that ought to be clear. And this particular patient had very advanced lung fibrosis. <coughs> they, they also had uh, an enlarged heart because they, um, they had a problem there as well. And this is just to show you the sort of picture that we get with an HRCT scan. This is what's called cross-sectional imaging. So they essentially do a number of different slices up and down you like that. And you can see this patient has some abnormalities here, um, which show that they have some lung fibrosis. And so what do, how do we treat lung fibrosis? Well, we usually um, advise, uh, well, I say usually, but if, if it's severe or if it's getting worse, then most doctors would recommend that you have an immunosuppressant drug if that's appropriate for you to dampen down the immune system. And the ones which are used are cyclophosphamide and a tablet called mycophenolate mofetil. And I'll just put this up quite, quite quickly. This is a paper, a big study, which was published last year. And this is the one of the lung function tests called the force vital capacity. And you can see that with either treatment, the lung capacity improved a little bit. It wasn't that great, but there was a slight improvement, and at least it didn't get worse. So that really provided some of the evidence base for giving these immunosuppressant treatments. From the point of view of pulmonary arterial hypertension, I think it's been, quite, it's been exciting over the last 10 to 15 years because really there have been a whole load of new drugs that have been shown to bring some benefit to pulmonary hypertension. Unfortunately, they're not as good as we would like them to be, but there are a number of different options. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Some of you, maybe one or two of you here, have got pulmonary hypertension, and you'll recognize these groups of drugs. But I just mention them because they're actually different pathways, and um, because we know more and more about the causes of pulmonary hypertension, we think that there's too much activity of this pathway, the endothelium pathway, so we want to block it with one of these drugs. We think there's not enough activity of these two pathways, and so we want to supplement them with these drugs. So, and sometimes we, in fact, quite commonly, the, the respiratory physicians use a combined approach, and they give you combinations of these drugs. So, for example, you might be an ambrosentan, which would be um, opposing this pathway, and you might be, have that in combination with tadalafil, which would supplement the nitric oxide pathway. So they're very often you know, combinations of drugs. And, but as I say, these in, in this country, these drugs um, and the combinations of drugs tend to be directed by the pulmonary vascular units. 